Uh, Delegate Mike Pushkin joins us. He is the head of the Democratic Party in the state of West Virginia as well. Mike, good morning to you, sir. Good morning. How are you all doing? Great. Uh, Don't you drive for a living or or for uh, part of a living, Mike? I I, I was listening to your conversation (laughs) about maps with great interest because, yes, I was a cab driver uh, for many, many years. And uh, when I first started driving a cab, you know, you were expected to get a uh, map book, you know, of the greater Charleston area where I drove. And, uh, and you try not to use the map book, of course. You know, you want to be a good cab driver. <laughs> See? Uh, you know, and, and then, you know, with long trips back in, in uh, it seems like it doesn't seem that long ago when we would get on, you know, MapQuest. People would get on MapQuest on the computer and yep. print up their little step-by-step maps. But, uh, yeah, those days are, are gone, and we now have GPS. And uh, sometimes, uh, most of the time it works, but sometimes it will send you into a, a, a cow pasture or okay. something. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, uh, it still happens. Well, so and it, all it the needs some, it needs some tweaking. Yeah, and all the stuff that yeah. comes along with it, ways, and you know, you yep. find out where the the officers may be and where mm-hmm. the the traffic uh, kerfluffle could be. And... There was a great episode of The Office back when that was a was a prime time TV show where Steve Carell's GPS was taking him into a lake. <laughs> And he drove right into it because he said that the GPS would not be wrong. He drove his car right into the lake. It's a great show. I, you know, uh, when we first started using them in the uh, in the taxis, I had several times where it was definitely, you know, taking me. If I would have followed it, I would have drove into a creek or a river. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, some of the roads just don't match up with what they have on there. So. Yeah, they went in doubt. You know, you could always just swallow your pride, pull over and ask for direction. <laughs> no chance. Not going to happen, Mike. Gonna Mike, happen. we had Ben Salango on the program earlier uh, this week, uh, yesterday, in fact. And on Friday, Steve Williams will be on, the mayor of Huntington. And we were talking about the uh, situation with the Democrats and who's going to run for governor. We now know it won't be Ben. And we mm-hmm. presume it will be Steve. Uh, you talk to me about Ben's decision to not run for governor this time around. Well, I think uh, Ben was a, a great candidate uh, when he did run last time. Obviously, the the you know the uh, there was a big shift uh, in 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 politics from when he first entered the race, I believe in in you know 2019 to when the election in 2020 happened. A lot of that was uh, due to the pandemic, and uh, you know the governor's. Uh, daily press press conferences, which were really campaign events that he that he started doing during that time. Uh, but I, you know, Ben's a friend of mine. I respect his decision. Uh, he's a great county commissioner down here, and we're uh, lucky to have him on the county commission. Now, Mayor Williams, uh, I believe, will make a great candidate, and I'll let him make the announcement for himself. But I think uh, Mayor Williams has an excellent story to tell. He's the only three-term mayor. Of Huntington, he is, uh, and that's, and they have term limits there. He's allowed to have three terms, but he's the only mayor, first mayor in Huntington history to actually be elected for three terms. And uh, if you remember, uh, Huntington was in pretty bad shape when Mayor Williams first was first elected. Uh, they were unable to pay their police officers or firefighters. They had major, major problems, and uh, he's really turned that city around. And uh, I think he has a very interesting story to to tell the rest of the state i think he he will make a a great candidate if he if he chooses to do so bill good morning mike uh the uh uh, the democrats in the last 15 20 years as far as winning elected office are basically non-existent obviously some exceptions yourself and others but compared to what we had back 15 years ago there are very few now elected democrats What's a magic uh, magic pill to take? How do you reverse this? How do you get more Democrats elected to office? That you uh, obviously what you've been doing in the last few months, or excuse me, the last few years, has not worked. Well, yeah, you're correct. We need to we need to look at what we've been doing, and and one thing that and we need to look at actually some of the things that that Republicans did uh, back in the uh, '90s and early 2000s when they were. Uh, in, in the minority, and, and one of the things they did is they challenged us on every uh, every race on the ballot, and that's uh, our goal now. Uh, that's our, is, and we're in the recruitment period right now. I think a lot of the Republicans have announced very early, but you'll see more and more announcements from our side you know, later on in the summer, Labor Day a little bit, and past that. But um, 
you take, uh, I guess, as Wayne Gretzky said, you know, you're going to uh, miss 100% percent of the shots you don't take. Uh, so, as, as challenging as it is, uh, we've got to our we've got to recruit uh, credible candidates, uh, hardworking candidates, and, and candidates that have a that have a positive message for West Virginia up and down the ballot. I, I do know one thing. I, I think if we talk honestly about the track record of the Republicans over the past decade, uh, it's abysmal. It really is. Every single aspect of state government right now is completely dysfunctional, and that's something we don't talk enough about. You know, the, uh, I, the Democrats yesterday, we issued a, a call for a special session. It's likely that we're going to have a special session with the, uh, the governor uh, touting this, uh, this surplus uh, but you know that surplus doesn't mean a whole lot uh, if you're a correctional officer that just finished a 14-hour shift because your prison is understaffed, and and you're driving, you know, barely keeping your eyes open while you're driving 50 miles to get home because there aren't enough correctional officers in this state. Uh, it doesn't mean a whole lot if you're a, a student at WVU and you're worried about whether or not your course of study is going to still be there for you to finish and get your, your degree or, or postgraduate work because maybe uh, your course of study might be on the chopping block because of, of mismanagement and, uh, and low enrollment in our, in our state colleges and universities. And it definitely, you know, that surplus definitely doesn't mean anything. Uh, if you're a, a foster kid, uh, they can't find placement for one of the 8,000 foster children in our state that aren't being taken care of. Yeah, I've been receiving reports that that the state is, is dropping off uh, foster kids at hotels and motels across the state with very little supervision. So tell me how state government is functioning under this last 10 years of Republican rule. Yeah, I, I'm going to carry us back to getting uh, recruiting candidates. Uh, that What you say is exactly right, going to need good, credible folks running for office. But how do you find those folks now with the environment that the Democrats find themselves in now? It takes time. It takes money. It takes a commitment. And if you think your chances of winning an election is fairly remote, how do you convince someone to go against this this brick wall requiring the money, the time, the passion when the chances of winning are fairly remote? So to me, there's a it's a uh, quagmire. I know the uh, it's aspirational you want to do this, but in practical terms, how do you pull it off? Well, it's uh, it's not it's because it's we. It's, it's going to take a whole lot of effort. And one of the things we started off in, in, as soon as, as the changeover happened with the state party was to start really rebuilding the infrastructure from the county level on up. You know, I don't know who the best uh, candidate in uh, Berkeley County may be, but uh, folks who live over there who are, are you know, within the party infrastructure over there, uh, they will know, you know who's doing things in the community, who are the people that are well-respected and, and, and trusted in the community. And then once you know, we identify these folks, we talk to them, and, yeah, it's going to be an uphill battle. But you know, I believe West Virginia is worth fighting for, and I think there's a whole lot of other people who think this state is worth fighting for too. And, uh, yeah, the, uh, the odds are against us in many parts of the state, but we're going to keep fighting. Uh, West Virginians deserve choices when they go into the voting booth, and the state deserves a better government. Uh, this government is not working for the people of West Virginia right now. Maria. And uh, you know, I know that I know the governor may have a cute dog, and he can go around and, and tout his budget surplus, but it's it, it's not every aspect of state government. I could go from the DHHR, which we've had to split up into separate uh, departments because it's completely dysfunctional. To I mentioned our, our jails and our prisons, which have been under a state of emergency for almost a year now, and and the governor and the Republicans can't seem to come to a consensus on exactly how to address it because they're not really because they're not having the meetings uh, to uh, uh, the division of highways. I'm getting reports about a huge mess in the division of highways. They've had to stop work on a, a major road in north central West Virginia because of mismanagement mismanagement under the division of highways. Um, I could go on. Just name name a, a department of state government, and I can tell you how dysfunctional it is. Mainly because so, we have a governor that doesn't show up for work. Okay. <laughs> so, Maria, go ahead. so Mike, uh, back to Bill's point about finding these candidates. You talked about, 
you know, in essence, coming down to the county level and even um, even more local than that. So are there people out there um, who are willing to run? It's interesting. My, maybe it's not. Um, but my two adult children um, live and work in the Martinsburg area, and we have dinner, you know, at least once a week, sometimes more than that. But, you know, we talk about just the level of acrimony and and – First off, as young people, why would they want to do this, regardless of what party they're affiliated with? I mean, it's it's grueling work. It's hard work. You get no credit for it. Where are you depressing and, me more than and, Seth did yeah, this morning? And there are, um, you know, there's there's not a lot of reward at the end of the at the end of the game. Do you have candidates in the wing for some of those statewide offices? Do you have? Attorney General, do you have Secretary of State? Do you have um, anybody coming to mind? And I know it's early, but um, are there people or no? Yeah, and uh, yeah, there are. We've had lots of conversation with many uh, uh, qualified <laughs> candidates who want to uh, enter into public service or return to public service uh, for the right reasons uh, because they want to help West Virginians do better. And yet the conversations are being had, uh, and as we move on into the summer and into the fall, you'll be hearing more announcements. But the, the plan is and the goal is to challenge uh, the Republicans on, on every spot on the ballot and give West Virginians choices. And uh, so, yeah, there are folks who are still interested in public service for all the right reasons. And, you know, you mentioned, like, lower we have, uh, even at the municipal level. If you look at what's going on in some of these uh, – off your municipal elections, um, Democrats are winning at that level because uh, that level is less partisan. Some of the races are actually nonpartisan, but even some of the partisan municipal races, we are still winning because at that level, it's not so much about uh, it's far from national politics. It's about what really matters to people, you know, whether their streets going to get fixed, whether their uh, you know their their trash is getting picked up, and and quite frankly, we do a better job of governing. And we are winning it on those races. I think the, the Tr- South Charleston City Council uh, now has a Democratic majority after a couple of races, a couple of seats on that council flipped. Uh, you know, the, the small town of Chesapeake, West Virginia, just elected its first African American woman as mayor. Uh, it's historic. Uh, our, you know, other in other parts of the state, we are still, you know, we are still winning at the municipal level and building a bench for the future. Mike, you used the term, uh, I used nonpartisan earlier. We currently have the school board as nonpartisan. The judges are elected nonpartisan. However, there is a push uh, on both of these to make them partisan elections as opposed to nonpartisan. What is your position on that? Well, you know, they just made the judicial races uh, nonpartisan just a few short years ago. Um, the le- so I think it would be... Uh, a bit hypocritical of the Republicans were going to come back just a few short years, you know, just a couple election cycles later, and then take it back. So I, I don't believe they're going to do that. I, well, I may not be able to do it, but with uh, Charlie Trump, uh, who is one of the, who is a champion of making the judges nonpartisan, without Charlie mm-hmm. Trump uh, in his position in the Senate, uh, I I don't know. I my I've heard a lot of folks express interest; they would like to see both of these as as partisan rather than nonpartisan. So. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the problems, I, the problems that I had when they made it nonpartisan, and I think they've gone back and addressed that, is when you know the election is nonpartisan and in the primaries you could have uh, judges elected to a statewide office when you're talking about Supreme Court or now the uh, Intermediate Court with a, uh, a, a simple plurality instead of actually having a majority of the voters support them. And I think that's an issue. I do believe we went back and addressed that, and they have to get over a certain threshold, or there would be a runoff. Mike uh, that was the main issue that I had with it. Is just that when you when it's not Republican versus Democrat, you could win with the with the, without a majority. W. Mike Pushkin is our guest on the program. He is the West Virginia State Democratic Party chairman. Were you in Wheeling yesterday, Mike, when Trans- Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg was there? No, I was unable to make it up there. I was not in. But that was, uh, uh, you know, great to see that uh, the um, 
you know, Secretary uh, Buttigieg was able to visit Wheeling, and, and they were t- show that they uh, you know, that a Democratic mayor over in Wheeling was uh, properly using federal funds uh, in order to uh, you know, improve the city's streetscape and, uh, um, and you know, improve the business climate up in, uh, in Ohio County and uh, doing very good things and, and uh, governing the, the, the way that we're uh, you know, the, uh, in a way that we can be proud of. And it was all made possible through the infrastructure bill. Um, you know, that of course was not supported by Congressman Moody, not supported uh, by uh, Congresswoman Miller, um, and uh, was uh, something that you know, President Trump uh, talked about doing every other week, but just couldn't get done because uh, he wasn't very good at governing. Uh, but it was done during the first two years of the, of the Biden administration, and we're seeing the benefits of it left and right all across the state. Let's talk about August interims and what may become a special session as well in regards to this extra revenue uh, still remaining with the state. Mike, how much do you know about this at this time, and how much input will Democrats have on any of the discussion down there? Well, uh, I feel that we should should have uh, more input than we do because uh, we're actually – we want to help with actually solving the state's many, many problems. And like I said before, when the governor touts this uh, this surplus, it doesn't mean a whole lot to people who are suffering left and right because of the, just the mismanagement that's going on in this state. So uh, yesterday, the uh, Democrats in the House, uh, the caucus that I'm a member of, uh, issued a letter uh, calling for a special session during the August interims uh, to not just address the uh, the state of emergency that our, our correctional system's in right now. I mean, the governor called in the National Guard. Uh, for our prisons um, almost a year ago, and nothing has been done to address this. So uh, we we issued a letter to um, to put you know put that on the special session, which is which is likely to happen if the Republicans can come up with a consensus. We have ideas on how to address this, and I can get that into that in a second. But we also called for them to address the foster care crisis. We have eight thousand children in, in the, uh, under the care of the state right now, and we are failing them. And, the, and these are uh, this is a segment of the population that is incredibly vulnerable, to say the least. And if we can't take care of these kids who have nobody else looking out for them, then I, you know our, our government is simply not functioning. And, and also, we called for uh, funding for higher education. You know, we it's uh, you know, WVU. You hear about uh, all these different uh, courses of, of study that are now uh, potentially on the chopping block. Uh, so you talk about low enrollment now. You're going to have very low enrollment if you cut all these different programs that they're talking about cutting. And it's not just WVU. Uh, there are uh, institutions in the state that have been here for over 100 years, over 100 years that are now possibly going to have to shut their doors, uh, really because of, of some of the policies that we've seen come out of, this, out of the state house over the past 10 years of Republican rule. Uh, so we're calling for a special session, not just to address corrections, but also the foster care crisis and higher education. Uh, the three of the many uh, crises that our state are, is facing at this point. Let's get into the foster care situation a bit more and the splitting up of DHHR. So uh, tell me the effect of that and where the positivity will come on improving the foster care situation in the state from that, if you think it will at all. Well, I mean, it, it simply you got to do more than just divide the DHHR up into uh, three separate departments, or you'll, you'll just go from having one large uh, dysfunctional department to having three slightly smaller dysfunctional departments. I mean, there's a we've really got to take a deep dive into what you know, the, changing the culture over there. And uh, what I do is I actually listen to the folks who work there, and not just at the top level, the people who have been there for a long time and some of the folks who have worked with these children, and to find out what an actual real solution is. But you know, that's a heavy lift, and, that, and it's a complicated issue. And unfortunately, you know, my friends on the other side of the aisle like to talk about national issues all the time and, 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 and talk about uh, culture war issues that really don't get us anywhere. While the state is in crisis on many levels, especially when it comes to foster care, we don't have enough placement. There are not enough places to uh, – first of all, the foster care crisis is mainly caused by uh, the, you know, the drug epidemic that has just ravaged the state. 
and I have to say, you know, Monday was a deadline for the governor to appoint uh, his uh, his directors uh, to the board for the West Virginia First Foundation. It's supposed to talk about how to spend uh, the drug settlement money. He did not meet the deadline. I've not even heard yet of any of the possible directors he's going to appoint because it's not a priority for him. The Office of Drug Control Policy hasn't had a director in now seven months because that hasn't been a priority for him. Instead, he wants to tweet about the southern border. Well, we have drug problems in this state, and he's not doing anything about it. He's left these offices open. That's what's led to, uh, in, in many cases, led to this foster care crisis. But what could we do right now? We could make it easier for foster families to take care of these kids. We could listen to them. What would it take to make it easier to, to – um, you know, help them take care of these children, uh, give them rate increases for one thing, uh, making it easier for the for uh, for parents to act to to keep their children, um, you know, address some of the services we could provide for them. But the problem is we can't just ignore it, and that's what we're doing now. We, yeah, but governor, it's more worried about running for seventh Senate than doing his job. But you and say that, ignoring it. You're talking about uh, specifically Governor Justice, but at the at the at the local level, the bureaucratic level, what are these folks doing who run DHHR to enhance this situation? Well, at the local level, you don't have enough folks working for Child Protective Services because they aren't compensated well enough for a very, very difficult job uh, that you often can't just leave at work. You know, what, the things that they see and the things that they deal with on a day-to-day basis, it, it comes home with you. It's a very difficult job, and if you can make – you know, more money uh, working at a McDonald's or Walmart and, and a, a job that, that doesn't that you don't bring home with you, then that's what we're, you know, that's what we're going to lose people to. It's a tough job, and we have to compensate people for it, but it has not been addressed. Uh, final questions for Mike Pushkin, uh, Bill Stubblefield. Yeah, let, shifting to the national level, do you have any sense at all of what Senator Manchin is going to do? Um, no, I, I think that you know, he has said that he is going to make an announcement uh, later this year. And if you look at when he announced he was running for re-election in 2018, I believe it was in December or January, uh, I think that he has time to make his decision on his own. I do feel that if he decides to run for re-election for Senate, that he will win. Um, even without making the announcement, without even declaring what his intentions are, he's already outraised both uh, Congressman Mooney and Governor Justice combined. Um, I, I think that people know that he has uh, you know, always been willing to work across party lines to actually get uh, a job done uh, for the people of West Virginia and are less concerned about uh, politics than, uh, than he is about uh, you know, policy and actually getting things done. So I believe if he, if, it, if his decision is to run for re-election, I believe he's going to be re-elected. Our mutual friend, uh, former delegate John Doyle, was telling me yesterday that if you listen to the things that Joe Manchin has said recently, it indicates that he will be running uh, once again for his Senate seat. Huh. Well, I, I, I agree. Those are the signals that I'm seeing as well. Mike Pushkin, thank you so much. Did you have a final comment, Maria? I, did, I was just going to ask, Mike, um, so I'm not accused of being a Debbie Downer. Um, are you optimistic about the future of the Democratic Party in West Virginia? Yeah, I remain optimistic. And I know, like I said, it's it's not an easy task. I understand what we're up against. It's been, uh, you know, yes, years and years of, uh, of the messaging on a national level that uh, that really mischaracterizes the Democratic Party. But we've always been the party that's uh, fighting for just regular working class West Virginians. You know, we're the party that's fought to make sure if you, if you get sick, you're able to see a doctor, that your kids have good schools to go to, that you have good roads to drive on. Um, that you get, if you, you know, work for a living, you get a fair wage that you can live off of. Uh, and, and, and the party that stands up for basic human rights for everybody. Uh, that's always been the Democratic Party, and unfortunately, the Republicans only want to talk about uh, national issues or, or cultural war issues or issues that really don't affect the day-to-day lives of West Virginia. So, you know, I'm, you know, I'm optimistic that uh, the, uh, you know, the arc of the moral universe does bend towards justice. So, yes, I remain optimistic. All right, and uh, bonus points for invoking the Ark of the Moral Universe clause on the program. (laughs) That's pretty amazing. I'll give you 10 extra points for that. Hey, thanks. I appreciate your time this morning, Mike. 
Hey, thanks, thanks for having me on. Appreciate y'all. Thanks. Uh-huh. Delegate Mike Pushkin, he is the head of the West Virginia Democratic Party at 932.